Have you been diagnosed with either diverticulosis or diverticulitis? If so, you're not alone. It's quite common, and this video may be for you. Although the medical and scientific communities are apparently perplexed at the cause, this diagnosis follows the same exact pattern as any other chronic degenerative condition which plagues us today. So let's dive into things from the perspective of the microbiome. But first, some background information. If you're new, be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel and also follow me on Instagram and Facebook as The Microbiome Expert. Diverticular disease can be grouped into diverticulosis and diverticulitis. Diverticular disease is the eighth most common outpatient diagnosis in the United States, while asymptomatic diverticulosis is often an incidental finding prevalence up to 20% in subjects undergoing colonoscopy. Diverticulosis affects over 50% of individuals age 60, and up to two-thirds of U.S. adults age 70 or plus. Most of these people are asymptomatic, no symptoms. But some will go on to have symptoms, whether IBS-like, as in symptomatic, uncomplicated diverticular disease, which is defined as chronic diverticulosis with associated chronic abdominal pain, in the absence of acute symptoms of diverticulitis or overt colitis. About 20% of those with diverticulosis will go on to develop diverticulitis. And about 5-10% to will find themselves here, complicated diverticulitis, where abscesses, fistulas, obstructions, and perforations become serious issues of morbidity and mortality. So, from a quality of life viewpoint, we're wanting to avoid all of the IBS-like symptoms for most, and for a few, these ghastly images to the right. On top, you see an illustration of an inflamed perforated diverticulum, and another not inflamed. In B, you see the resected sigmoid colon, where one indicates the inflamed perforated diverticulum, and two, the uninflamed. And in C, is during the surgery where the arrow points to the abscess. But how does one get to this point? There are a number of factors at play. Here, the authors mention genetics. And while there is data to show that there is a genetic connection, this plays a smaller role, something I discuss in my other videos. Usually, genetics accounts for less than 10% of a given disease. And here, you can read how the overall occurrence and rates of severity of diverticulitis are jumping but our genes aren't changing. And here, these authors highlight constipation as a proven risk factor. I hear about constipation all of the time in my consultations, and it's my second most popular protocol. And constipation is not just a risk factor for diverticulitis. Most Parkinson's patients will suffer from constipation for years prior to their first motor symptoms. Constipation is a big red flag. Your gut is screaming at you that it is dysbiotic. And from this paper in Table 2, we see a fairly comprehensive list of the proven factors associated with diverticular disease pathogenesis. Under diverticulitis, we see a lot of lifestyle factors. These are why the rates are jumping. These factors play a huge role in all chronic degenerative diseases that we battle today. We see obesity which is a well-established risk factor, while habitual exercise is associated with a reduced risk of developing diverticular disease, again, both lifestyle. Smoking, which have been shown to increase the likelihood of complications in diverticulitis. Red meat consumption, sorry carnivores, more on this later. NSAIDs, such as aspirin use, which has been shown to drive a higher incidence of acute diverticulitis in a large population study with 22 years of follow-up, and you'll see it again in another study later in this video. Not mentioned here, fiber, where in studies, the consumption of a high-fiber diet was associated with lower risk of hospital admissions and death from diverticular disease, while a low dietary fiber intake increased the incidence of symptomatic diverticular disease, and the microbiome, which is affected by the aforementioned fiber, 
antibiotics and PPI use, among others. So, speaking of the microbiome, let's take a deeper dive. From this paper, we get a couple of things. One, you should read these quotes here. We previously saw that red meat consumption was one of the clearly established risk factors for diverticulitis. Here, these authors touch on the mechanism and mention how bad actors like to ferment proteins, names such as Enterobacteriaceae and Streptococcus, names I mention all of the time. More on that in a second. They also have a good summary in Table 1 of all of the fecal microbiome studies to date in diverticular disease, and in Table 2, the studies which looked at the mucosal microbiome. Although the data is not extensive, nor terribly consistent, possibly given the many variables in study design, we do see several times the family Enterobacteriaceae mentioned. And as I always say, this is the last family you want a high abundance of in your microbiome. More on this later as well. To revisit the red meat factor, we have yet another paper which highlights some of the same considerations I mentioned. Heme as a source of iron. And if you're familiar with my videos, the bad guys love iron. Amine production, which is toxic. The most familiar one you know is histamine, but there are others. Something I touch on in these two videos. And we just saw how the bad actors like to ferment protein. If you recall from my videos, the good guys like to ferment locked up sugars. I talk much more about these concepts in my videos on the carnivore diet and the ketogenic diet. So now we'll revisit that Enterobacteriaceae family we mentioned. From this paper, you can see the design here. The authors quote that the most discriminative species were derived largely from the family Enterobacteriaceae. What does that mean? That means that the biggest difference found between those subjects with uncomplicated acute diverticulitis and the controls was the abundance of the species you see in Table 2, them being significantly lower in healthy controls. We see E. coli, the classic opportunistic pathogen, which you know well, along with Klebsiella pneumoniae, Enterobacter aerogenes, and Klebsiella varicola, all names I often mention as bad actors, and all within the family Enterobacteriaceae. So, is it a coincidence that these pro-inflammatory, opportunistic pathogens are significantly higher in an inflammatory condition? And lastly, just a point of note, we see the authors state that diverticulitis patients have a higher microbial diversity than controls. I explain the diversity and sanity in this video. I could show you a million papers where those who are ill have a higher diversity. You can have a high diversity, but it can be diverse with bad actors, the classic example being colorectal cancer with a high number of oral pathogens. So if you have a report or read an article and someone mentions alpha diversity as being important, ignore them. Run. They don't know what they're talking about. I hope you're enjoying the video so far. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and recommend to friends and family. Also, if you're feeling extra generous, hit the super thanks below. So here is another paper, this one also a rectal swab paper. Again, there aren't many papers in total, so we're referencing stool, swab, biopsy, and mucosal data. And what do we see? Many of the same names I'm always mentioning in my videos. The good guys, subdole granulum, ruminococcus, oscillospira, buterosococcus, lachnospira, panerostypes, and yes, F. prosetii are all significantly higher in the healthy controls, while one well-established bad actor, Fusobacterium, which, by the way, is the prime suspect in colorectal cancer, is significantly higher in those with acute diverticulitis. And here we have a new 2024 paper which was not included in the previous review. This shotgun metagenomics paper, which is the best technology we have, found in this study comparing the fecal microbiomes of 121 women diagnosed with diverticulitis compared to 121 controls, that the controls had significantly more of the butyrate-producing, oxygen, pH, and antibiotic-sensitive, health-promoting bacteria I'm always talking about, like species from Eubacterium, 
allostypes, acilibacter, subdolegranulum, E. elegans, which, by the way, is in the genus Lactospira, and yet again, half prositzii. Well, on the other hand, the woman with diverticulitis had significantly more bad actors like Hegrothella lenta, Hungartella hathawaii, Flavonifractopodii, various known bad acting species from the genus Clostridium, and the arpitensic pathogen I mention often and highlighted in my video on Crohn's disease, R. navis. And speaking of inflammatory bowel disease, here the authors mention how diverticulitis shares symptoms, histological features, and inflammatory changes with both IBD, that's Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, and with IBS. And I would strongly argue that they also share a microbiome picture as well. For much more on this, you can watch my videos on Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, and IBS. And when we look at risk factors for diverticular disease, it has the same risk factors as do the many other conditions I've highlighted. Again, it comes down to damaging the gut microbiome, causing dysbiosis, a pro-inflammatory balance of the bad actors in the gut. And PPIs are famous for disrupting the gut microbiome balance. These authors found that the non-modifiable risk factors associated with diverticulitis, age, hypertension, chronic renal failure, diabetes, and left colon location were all significantly associated. And of the modifiable factors they analyzed, only PPIs, proton pump inhibitors, showed a significant association. Of note, advanced disease severity was associated with aspirin use. So how do PPIs mess up your gut microbiome? By dropping HCL output, the pH in the stomach increases, which not only allows bad actors to pass through the stomach, who would otherwise have been killed off by a low pH, but also inhibits your ability to digest protein, leaving more protein for fermentation in the lower gut, which we've already established the bad guys like to ferment. More protein for fuel, more bad guys. I talk much more about this in extreme detail in these two videos here. And the same fermentation story holds true for the carnivore diet, which I know carnivores don't want to hear. But really, how many videos do I have to make loaded with plenty of scientific references do the carnivores have to see before the protein fermentation story sinks in? And in my experience, by far and away, the number one destroyer of not only the gut microbiome, but of any microbiome in your body, is the use of excessive antibiotics. I have several videos to include this one dedicated to this important topic. These researchers found that among 29,168 women without a history of diverticulitis at baseline, with a mean age of 72 years, that prior antibiotic use in mid and late adulthood and recent antibiotic use, regardless of age, were independently associated with subsequent development of acute colonic diverticulitis. They go on to state, what I and many others do as well, that, quote, the use of antibiotics which may irrevocably configure gut microbial communities into unfavorable ecological states more prone to digestive diseases associated with perturbations in host microbial interaction. And when we look at FMT, fecal microbiota transfer, which is the donation of a whole new healthy microbiome to someone who needs one, we see the same type of results I'm always highlighting. In fact, I have a whole video dedicated to FMTs, which highlights the power of the microbiome. So here we have a case study of a 63-year-old woman with a 13-year history of multiply recurrent and multifocal diverticulitis, previously treated with numerous short courses of intravenous and oral antibiotics for acute flares, two segmental colon resections, and suppressive antibiotic therapy for recurrent disease. Secondary to multiple courses of antibiotics, the patient developed a C. diff infection. No surprise here. The proven number one risk factor for a C. diff infection is excessive antibiotic use. Feel free to watch my video on this topic. So what was done for this poor woman? She was treated with a single round of FMT and subsequently stopped all antibiotics at the time of the FMT. In 20 months of follow-up, 
the patient had no further recurrence of diverticulitis nor CDI. That's the powerful effect the balance of the critters in your gut has on your health. I don't offer up FMTs, but I do offer up the next best thing, which is far less costly and invasive. What needs to happen is a significant shift from a pro-inflammatory microbiome dominated by taxa from the family Enterobacteriaceae and others like R. navis to one which is healthy and immunotolerant dominated by the antibiotic-sensitive butyrate-producing taxa within the order Eubacteriales. In order to do that, we need to feed the good actors who have been sidelined so they can change the environment of the microbiome, such as reduce the pH. I don't focus at all on supposed targeted killing with antimicrobials. If it does work, it's temporary. You're not going to kill all the bad actors. And if you don't change the environment, they will return to dominate. If you tried endless rounds of antibiotics and natural antimicrobials, you know this to be true. I see it all the time. So if you're ready to try something more intelligent for your symptomatic diverticular disease, feel free to check out my new protocols and choose the one which is right for you. If you liked the video, don't forget to subscribe. Also, somewhere around here, you can go to my website where you can schedule a consultation with me. You can also view the protocols. And here, you can watch the next video.